Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to this talk about MicroPython. Uh, MicroPython is a snake that fits into small places, um, particularly, specifically, microcontrollers. And we're going to be talking about that today. My name is Sebastian. Uh, I'm a chemical engineer, actually. So I don't have a computer science background or electrical engineering background. Um, yet I'm still able to make these things. And a couple of years ago, I don't think I would have been able to do it. Or if I was able to do it, it would take more time than I would be willing to spend, I think. Uh, I work as a senior consultant at WebStep. And I co-founded a company that deals with um, uh, parsing technical drawings from, uh, for example, oil and gas platforms to get information from PDF drawings. Now, the agenda for today is we're going to be talking about the language itself. We're going to have a look at some specific uh, microcontrollers that you can use to run, run MicroPython. We're going to actually, if everything works well, we're going to be flashing a microcontroller here and uh, getting up and running so that you can see for yourself how easy it is. We're going to be trying to interact with these things here, uh, if the demo gods are willing. Um, and if there's time, we'll be talking about how you can optimize your code. So um, up, again, up until recently, fairly recently, uh, uh, humans were mediators between the digital, digital realm and the physical space. So uh, I would sit on my computer. I would talk to another person that sits on his computer. And we would communicate or I would buy something on online. But uh, humans uh, were the ones that acted in the physical space. So this is changing now. Uh, with IoT, it's almost like an intrusion of the digital, of cyberspace, into the physical realm here. And this could be a very good thing, or it could be a, a not so good thing. And uh, in my opinion, the one thing that uh, unites us all if you're a web developer, a back-end developer, embedded developer, is that we help to create reality. So we take part in this. So that's just food for thought. Now, Micro MicroPython was created by an Australian physicist. Uh, his name is Damien George. He came up with it uh, during his time in Cambridge, I think. Uh, it was backed by a Kickstarter campaign. They developed uh, the Pi board, which you can see here. Um, the language is under an MIT license. Uh, it runs on uh, the minimum in, uh, implementation runs on 128Ks of RAM and 8Ks of RAM. You could get it down to 4Ks of RAM, but you wouldn't be able to do uh, many meaningful things with it. It, um, it implements the Python 3.4 version. Uh, most of the uh, standard library has already been uh, written in MicroPython, uh, either completely rewritten or uh, ported. It also has um, some modules for dealing with the hard hardware. So you see the pins there. So there are some modules to getting information in and out of the pins. This is the logo of the European Space Agency, I think it's called. Um, they're now funding MicroPython. So Damien George, I think, uh, is uh, uh, getting funding to develop MicroPython for their use cases. And uh, they've been so kind as to say that any progress that they have is going to uh, go back into this uh, uh, general Im open implementation of MicroPython. Um, anyone from the UK, I think, would recognize this machine. This is called the BBC Micro. And in every school in the 1980s, um, there was one of these machines. Um, it's an 8-bit computer. Um, it's part of the, uh, the UK's um, computer literacy project going in the uh, 1980s. And it was accompanied by a television program called the, the Computer Program, which ran on BBC Two in 1982 teaching people how to use this. Now, recently, the UK government has said that we would like to 
provide every school children, every 12 year old in the UK with their own small micro, micro, microcontroller. This is the micro bit. Um, they have shipped this device to over 5,000 schools, hundreds of private schools as well, and it runs MicroPython on it. So the gener next generation is going to be learning how to deal with embedded programming through MicroPython. So it's already a pretty big deal. Um, MicroPython comes in uh, many different ports distribution. Um, the Pi board has its own port. Uh, you also have uh, other ports such as the ESP8266, ESP32. Um, Adafruit came up with its own flavor of uh, MicroPython that they call CircuitPython, and it's easier to interact with their products that way, but they're all fairly similar. Um, the standard library for MicroPython is a little bit different from uh, regular C Python is in that the, they're individually installed. So if you want to use one mod module, you install that module because uh, in order to reduce uh, size of the, of the firmware. Um, how it comes about, it's uh, either written from scratch uh, or it's ported from C Python uh, or another distribution or implementation of Python. Uh, and some modules are just uh, dummy modules, not uh, implemented yet. I guess they just raise a not implemented error or something. Uh, here are some examples. Um, so you get a lot of uh, uh, things included when you start up. So let's look at the microcontrollers. Here's a list of the microcontrollers. Some of them might be familiar to you. Um, first, the Pi board. It uh, runs on uh, um, a 168 megahertz Cortex M4. It has 192Ks of RAM. Um, and this is the reference hardware for MicroPython. Um, I haven't used it uh, myself, but um, I hear it's pretty good. There's a, this is version 1.1. So version 2 is being developed. Is, uh, I think it's going to be ready soon. This is a company called PyCom. They focus more on the connectivity of the, their devices. Um, what's pictured there is the low Pi. It has uh, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and LoRa antenna. Uh, I think the more recent ones uh, run on uh, ESP32. Um, they also have a product called uh, PhiPi, which has all the connectivity listed below. It has Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, dual mode, meaning regular and, and low energy. It has LoRa, Sigfox, and also uh, LTEM, I think, cellular connectivity. Now this one is interesting. This is the e ESP8266. And it was created by a Chinese manufacturer called Espressive, Espressive Systems. And it was originally intended to be a Wi-Fi module for your Arduino device. So people would buy this uh, so that their Arduino is connected through Wi-Fi. But some people figured out that this thing is many times more uh, powerful than the Arduino itself. So people just ended up buying these, uh, and they didn't need the Arduino anymore. Um, it's very cheap. So this thing costs you maybe 3 or $4. Not this one in particular. This is the Adafruit one. It's more expensive, but you can get um, a very cheap ESP8266. And they come in a uh, multitude of different uh, uh, types. Now, the next generation of microcontrollers from Espressive is called the ESP32. Now we're really talking. Now we're really getting, in, it's getting interesting. This has a microprocessor, uh, a dual core 240 megahertz. It has four megabytes of flash. Um, it has Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, which the ESP8266 uh, did not have Bluetooth. And it has a ton of I.O. pins. And, um, we're going to be looking at that particular microcontroller in the demo. So this is the pinout. Um, one interesting feature is that it has a lot of uh, touch pins, so you can use it directly for, uh, as a touch sensor. And to put in things into perspective, uh, the ESP32 has a dry stone MIPS rating of 600 MIPS. 
And this is just a, a performance metric. And uh, I think one MIPS is the uh, computing power of the VAX 11 780, uh, which was huge. I think it was uh, created in 1977. So 600 of these can now fit into your pocket. Uh, this is a table summarizing the specs of the different hardwares that we looked at. So you can see this one has um, um, a half kilobyte of RAM. Uh, some of them actually ship with four megabytes of RAM. Uh, now, let us connect the device to see if it works. Let's see. Will this work? So here you have an ESP32. This one you need to solder the pins yourself, but you can buy ones that are already uh, have the pins. So it has an OLED screen, a very nice one, and it boots up like this. So this just came from the manufacturer. So let me remove this one. We're going to be trying to flash it in the presentation. So um, what you need to get started is you pip install ESP tool, which is a Python package. And we're going to try to, let's see if we are on the right port here. Let's try it. So the first thing you need to do is erase the flash. And USB zero. Let's try that. And you know what? Let's try a different one. Because I with Linux, uh, it's good to map the the port. So I made a sim link because this can be USB zero, USB one, USB anything. So. I think this one is mapped to to MicroPython symlink, so we don't have to deal with that. Let's try. Oh, that's why. Okay. So we're now erasing the flash, and we use this instead, add a backup. And I think it's completed. Um, what we're going to do now is that we're going to use ESP tool to, fl to uh, write some firmware that's already been compiled. You can decide to compile your own uh, port, but they, uh, they uh, you can also just download it. So now it's writing mic MicroPython on an ESP32. And while this is going, let's look into serial port communication. Uh, how many of you know what UART is? Yeah. Um, so UART is a hardware device where um, so it takes a bit stream of 0101 and converts it into uh, bytes to and from. Um, it's asynchronous. It stands for Universal Asynchronous Receiver Transmitter. So you need to make sure that your laptop and your device is speaking, is communicating at the same uh, bits per second, or else you're just going to get uh, garble. Um, the tools that you can use to connect um, through to the UART is Screen, if you're on Linux. Putty, maybe, if you're on Windows. I use PyCocom. There is yet another terminal. If you want to write Python code that talks to this thing, you can use a package called PySerial. And there's also uh, Jupyter Notebook is what you're looking at right now. And you can run MicroPython code directly from your notebook, in this case, from your presentation. It's uh, very alpha, so I've been very lucky 
as of yet. So it looks like it's now, it now has MicroPython on it. If you would like to transfer files to this thing, uh, MicroPython has uh, a file system. Uh, you can use ampy, so you install it with pip install adafruit ampy. And this is an example of how you put the file into the, uh, into the microcontroller, boot.py. We can look. So what we're doing now is we're just running command line here. So we're trying to look at ampy. And you have some commands that you can do. You can get a file from the board, list files. So let's try to list a file. Damn. Python, ls. Uh, so we see that this thing ha now has boot.py. So uh, on MicroPython, if you put a file called boot.py, this is the this is the code that will execute uh, during a boot up. Uh, so that's uh, when you power cycle the thing, when you do a hard reset, or um, when it awakes from deep sleep. Um, I haven't done this yet, but it just came out the uh, uh, support for ESP32 is that you have a web REPL. So you now, if you connect this to Wi-Fi, set it up, you can leave this uh, in your box, in your device, and you connect, can connect to it through uh, Wi-Fi. So you just open your browser, connect to the thing, use your password if you set one, and from there you can uh, write uh, code interactively in the REPL. And you can also send and get files uh, very easily. So about the REPL, now that we're in, let's change the kernel to MicroPython. First, I'd like to see if it actually is connected. So print one. It's evaluated inside of the microcontroller, so it returns one. So now we're in REPL. Um, if you write help, uh, provides you s with some uh, uh, ways to get started. If you write help modules, you get a list of the supported modules that you can just import uh, immediately. Um, it supports auto indent indenting. So if you write the def function, and then it automatically indents for you. Uh, auto completion. So you can, uh, I don't know if that works uh, here in Jupyter, but you, you can do import uh, JSON, and then write JSON.tab, and then it gives you the options. Um, if you want to interrupt, you can use uh, Control-C. It has a paste mode available, which is very useful. Um, you start it with Control-E, do your pasting, and finish with Control-D. And lastly, a bitbucket variable is that if you uh, uh, evaluate to something, then you can get that uh, thing that you just evaluated by using this thing here. I don't know if that works here, but no. So moving on. Um, ESP, now we're on an ESP32, so we can look get the flash size in bytes, the available flash size. Uh, I mentioned the reset, soft and hard reset. Um, the soft reset clears the state of the MicroPython virtual machine, but leaves the hardware peripherals uh, unaffected. So you can either do a control D to do a soft reset in the REPL, or uh, write this code here. This is the same as exiting the program. Um, if you want to do a hard reset, you do import machine, machine.reset. That's the same, should be the same as unplugging and plugging this back in. Yeah, so. Um, we mentioned boot.py. Main.py is your program. So boot.py, boot maybe you want to set up how you connect to the Wi-Fi if, if it's available. You do the configuring, and then you set up main.py, which uh, you can change, and your boot.py will still be relevant, right? The code that you have in there. So if we have a look, this is uh, regular Python code. We're going to open the boot.py and read, and we're going to get what's in the file. So this is just, uh, I think it ships with that to get you started. So this is how easy it is to set up the web REPL. OK, let's move on to machine. Um, so the machine module is how you interact with all the pins on your device. 
Uh, it has a lot of things, and we're going to get go through a couple of them. It has a real-time clock uh, module. We're running this now. Uh, daytime, it gives you the daytime in a tuple. Um, you can connect to Wi-Fi. ESP32 su uh, supports uh, to set up your device as an access point, uh, which would mean you didn't, wouldn't need a router at all, and they would still be able to communicate. And uh, the second cell is how you connect uh, to the Wi-Fi. So we can try doing that. So what it's doing is that it's um, it's getting the uh, um, client. Oh, it's activating uh, and um, connecting to NDC with an empty password, and then it's uh, looping until it's connected. So now that we've done this stuff, let's see if we can get something to work. Um, now this thing is something I made with a friend. Um, it's a box that it's laser cut and I tried to to make sure that all the available pins on the ESP32 were uh, used. So it has a joystick, uh, which is a, it's basically two potentiometers, so it has a variable resistance in the x-axis and the y-axis. So um, there you have two uh, inputs to the microcontroller. It has a push, push button. Uh, it has a rotary encoder that you can rotate and push as well. It has two buttons. Uh, a microphone and an OLED screen. And if we're lucky, it's still working. So I'm going to disconnect this now. And I'm going to see if I'm connected. Oh, and al also, I also had micro SD in, so you can mount uh, a S micro SD card. So let's see if it works. Then we try to connect again. And then we hold our breaths. And it works. That's great. OK. I think I will also bring this back. Oh, how do I do that? I can maybe just show it when it's relevant. So let's get rid of that one. Uh, so we have two push buttons here. So how do we uh, communicate with these guys? We import from machine a class called pin, and then we create a button uh, which uses pin number 13. We specify that it's an input pin and that it has that we activate the pull-up resistor. So a pull-up resistor is an internal resistor uh, on the microcontroller that makes sure that um, uh, when there's no connection, when you kind of when the button is opens up the circuit, that it kind of uh, makes sure that the uh, uh, voltage is not floating around. It's set at either uh, uh, zero or one. So let's try to print the button dot value. So as I click, you see that the button dot value changes. So that's great. Um, you could do this from time import sleep. Uh, infinite loop, and then uh, print the button dot value. But I don't know how to interrupt from from Jupiter here, so we're just going to skip that one and talk about interrupt handlers. So interrupt handlers is something that interrupts your running code, uh, and you and it uh, runs a callback function that you define, and it's it can be very helpful. But try to uh, uh, use it if not sparingly, then the uh, amount of code in your interrupt handler should be very minimal. It should only do the things that you 
uh, need to do acting on the signal change. So an interrupt handler, in this case, we're going to write a callback called interrupt. Um, we're going to uh, set an interrupt handler to the button, which triggers on uh, a falling pin. So you can trigger on either uh, the button being pressed or it being b released. And handler is interrupt. So again, I think, um, uh, I don't, I'm not sure if we'll see the output, but what's going to happen then is that when you click the button, it's going to say uh, print out button clicked. So here you can uh, do behavior based on events like that. Uh, you also have a timer, so you can have a, a periodic timer doing uh, interrupts on your code, which is very nice. Uh, make sh uh, so the thing with interruption, uh, interruption handlers is that um, this actually interrupts your running code. If you are allocating in your main uh, uh, code, allocating uh, objects onto the heap, um, then it's really bad if uh, the code gets interrupted and then uh, you create a Python object inside of the interrupt handler. So this is uh, just not allowed. You, you, you're not able to do it. Um, so uh, an exception is uh, a Python object. So the text inside of the uh, exception is a Python object. So you're going to have to run this code. You're going to have to allocate memory uh, for your exception message um, if you want your exception message to, to be meaningful if something ha uh, happens in your interrupt handler. So now let's look at the hardware. So uh, this is an OLED display. Uh, I got it from China. Um, it's not very expensive. It runs on SPI. And SPI is a communication protocol. Um, it's one of two. You have the SPI and the I2C. And they both run on the same. Uh, pins on the microcontroller. It's called MOSI, MISU, and SEK. So what you have is you have, uh, uh, on the SPI, you have data going out, you have data coming in, and then you have a clock. So this is synchronous. You have a clock that, so that the devices know, can, uh, can synchronize with each other. It has a master-slave relationship. So you see the, uh, the, the box to the left is your microcontroller. And it has a SS at the bottom. That's the slave select. So you just, act, uh, you just specify a slave select pin on each of your um, components that, you're that you want to communicate through SPI so that the component knows, oh, it's me you're talking to. So that means that you can connect a lot of uh, components uh, on a single microcontroller. So this has SPI on the OLED screen and also on the micro USB. Um, I2C is. Uh, uh, a little bit different. You don't need as many uh, pins. You don't need to use as many pins. You don't have the slave select pin for every component. However, it's a little bit slower. Uh, and a little warning, the Arduino uh, microcontrollers, they don't have an internal pull-up resistor, but the other ones do. So if it doesn't work, your SPI thing on an on Adafruit device, that might be something you need to look into. So. What we do is that we import from machine pin and SPI and ADC. Is it being used? I don't think it's being used. So, so we make a function where we set up the display. We have a function where we clean up the display. And then we run this. And now we can see that if we can use the display. So we're going to fill a rectangle on the position x, y, 0, 0, width, height, and a color. So oh, I have to run it, and then so a yellow rectangle. So this is not a lot of co code. Are you guys able to see if, it, uh, if I put, up, put it here? Cool. Now we can go take it one step further we can uh, try to display text. Did it work? Yeah. It's small, but you can see it. So um, the opportunities are opening up now for what you can do. Now let's uh, use the joystick in conjunction with the screen. 
uh, the joystick, as I mentioned, is a um, potentiometer. So um, the voltage coming into the pin uh, uh, gets h higher or lower depending on the position of the stick. And it works in two axes. So then you need to use the ADC, which is uh, analog to digital conversion. So some of your pins might have this. And you set the attenuation level, which is the range uh, of the voltage that you want to read, and the bit size, which is how many uh, bits you want to div divide it into, the resolution. So here we, um, for a machine, import ADC now, which we're going to need. Um, we're going to specify a button. So this is the switch button. We're going to use it to interrupt. Um, ADCL is uh, the left and the right. Uh, it should be maybe X, Y. So we're going to set up these. And then we're going to run a loop where if we click the button, then we display, we clear the display and break out of the loop. If not, we're going to, um, yeah, let's just see what happens. Um, we specify coordinates, we clear the screen, and then we fill it with a circle. So, so now you can control a little dot on your display. And we kind of almost made a game. And then we click, and then it goes, goes away. Uh huh. There's a microphone here. And the microphone is situated be below the screen. It's, uh, all of these components are very cheap, I just have to mention. So if you just go and buy stuff, you can put them together in interesting ways and make cool stuff. So we're just going to instantiate it. Uh, this is uh, as well an analog to digital conversion. So there's an analog sound signal. We're converting it into digital. And now let's just read a value. 1263, that doesn't mean much to us. So let's do something else. Let's clear the display. The same thing, you break if the button is pressed. And then we're going to get the value from the mic. And then we're going to display it in the on the screen. And this is much more complicated than it needed to be, but I didn't have much time. So um, there's a try accept loop here, by the way. This is Python. So you can do a try and accept, and you can catch exceptions. And finally, is uh, you make sure to execute this code no matter what, if it uh, raises an exception or not. So we're going to display and do a garbage collect. So. If I can multitask. Any excuse to play music, I guess. So yeah, that worked. There's a rotary encoder. I'm not going to get into how it works because of time constraints. There's a lot of code here. This might not be interesting for you to, to look and parse through the code for every single time. So let's just run it, see what it does. And oh, I forgot to abort. There you go. And let's try to run it again. And maybe it wasn't good that I tried to run it again, but let's try. It's not surprising that something went wrong. Um, oh, it says transfer on deinitialized SPI. So this would happen once in a while. I would just have to reboot it. So we're really pushing our luck with uh, the um, number of, simply the number of devices that we have here. Um, but it's worth a shot. The rotary encoder, if we're going to do that, we're going to have to 
um, set up the display again. So we set up the display, and then there should be, uh, we need to set up the switch button. Where did we do that? Here. Oh. So we might just want to move on, I guess. Oh, there it goes. And the rotor encoder. Yeah. So the rotor encoder here, um, we are, oh, it's too bright. So we're rotating it, and as you rotate, we have a list of colors, and uh, you uh, cycle through the colors, and then we make a polygon where the uh, number of sides is proportional to the index in the list. So that's a lot of fun. Okay, so let's do something a little bit more serious that we can use. So we're going to try to mount the micro SD. Um, this is how you do that. Import OS, import SD card. SD card is uh, uh, an included driver in MicroPython. Um, you specify the pins that it's connected to. Since it's an S uh, SPI device, uh, use the same pins, and you mount. And from here, you can print os.list there, so to see what you have here. Now all of a sudden we have a folder called SD here. So this is a 16 gigabyte uh, memory card, which has nothing in it. So let's uh, create a file. Um, we're going to open test file, write, and write hello NDC. And now we're going to look what we have. We have a test file. And yeah. It has hello in the C in it, presumably. So that was the microcontroller. Um, we have tw 23 minutes left. So I think uh, before we do that, if we have time, let's go into the uh, theoretical again, maybe. We don't want to have too much fun. So um, with a microcontroller, there might be some size constraints, depending on which one you use. ESP32 is very powerful. You might uh, use some smaller ones. Um, so with the flash, when we're talking about the flash, um, parts of the flash might not be available as a file system. That's depending on your, uh, on your um, uh, uh, microcontroller that you're using as platform dependent. So what you can do then is that you can compile um, the MicroPython yourself to the port, and then you can just include in a folder, uh, I think it's called modules, you include it. And uh, you can also include uh, in a, that's for frozen modules. If you want to have frozen bytecode, there's a folder called scripts. So what this does is that it stores the, Pyth it compiles the Python code and then flashes it with the firmware. So uh, this m uh, enables you to put modules into this uh, uh, place where you weren't initially able to have it because you can't have a file system using that memory. Um, the difference here is that uh, um, one free, uh, compiles it to um, uh, byte code, which is uh, so you, you basically get a .mpy file, .mpy file, and you can use that. You can send it back and from. If you do frozen bytecode, it actually uh, goes into the firmware. So it becomes part of the firmware. Uh, these are the steps. Uh, you can look into those uh, maybe later. Um, when it comes to RAM, we, divide, we split it between compilation and execution. So with compilation, um, what happens when you import uh, a module? When you're running, in, running on this thing with your REPL and you do import OS, uh, there's a compiler inside of MicroPython that compiles uh, this text into a, a compile file, MPI file, and this takes up RAM. So uh, if you want to do that, you're going to have to spend RAM doing so. And if you instantiate objects, especially if your module that you're importing 
instantiates objects, th then this also goes into the RAM. Um, so the compiler itself requires RAM when it compiles, so this might uh, give you a memory error. So you want to limit uh, module, module imports. Don't import modules you don't need. Avoid uh, running code on import. So uh, encapsulate your code, running code in a function, initialization, initialization function or something. Um, in the execution phase, what you can do is you can um, uh, define constant types. Uh, so what that does is that as it compiles, it's substituting the uh, reference uh, to the value and is putting in the actual value itself. And this uh, helps uh, to save some RAM. Um, and this works for any uh, uh, value that, has, uh, numer that can be represented with a numer numeric value in the bytecode. Um, the same thing with if you have a lot of uh, data, like constant data, or a file, uh, a stream or something, you can actually uh, compile that as frozen bytecode, and you can actually run it directly or read it directly from Flash, which is nice. So um, here you have, in this first case, you're actually, uh, yeah, this one. So here, actually, you specify two strings in, during runtime and a third string that does the uh, concatenation. So uh, if you do this instead, um, the compiler is actually just going to uh, turn it into bytecode. So there's a th second thing that we have here, a device. And this is the mobile breadboard. Thanks a lot to my friend Morten Dilla for helping me setting this thing up for NDC. And let's explain what it is. We have an ESP32 microcontroller, uh, a low-end light. Uh, these are maybe 70 krona. Uh, $10. It has um, a little LED inside of here that you can turn on and off. It has a matrix display. Um, it has a humidity and temperature sensor that you can buy, and two piezo buzzers. So let's first look at the LED matrix, how you use that. And are we connected? Let's do this. Print one helps. No. Uh, let's do a power cycle again or reset. Maybe we can connect it through the regular REPL. That looks like it works. So let's just do that instead. We can copy paste the code. So um, this LED matrix has uh, four uh, by, they have eight by eight LEDs, and there are four of them in series. And you buy them like this. So it connects through SPI again. And you just um, sometimes you have to look into uh, the bo uh, the baud rate and uh, but the MISO and my uh, MOSI and the uh, clock pin uh, are usually uh, the same for your breadboard. So just learn how do, how your bread uh, sorry how your microcontroller works, your dev board, and it should be fine. So then um, we set up some someone made this. Uh, uh, module and pin 17 is the slave select pin. So we do the paste mode, we put it in, and oh, it's working, I think. So, what you can do with this one is that you can set the brightness, you can fill it, uh, empty it, and then you can display text. Uh, let's see. Okay. 
So what we did now is that you can't choose the font, but you can say, I want one, two, three, four, and it's going to display it. So you don't have to specify, oh, this pixel goes here, it goes there. Um, I think this is uh, the offset for each, uh, for each uh, unit of 8x8 eight eight in X and Y. So let's do something else. Let's open a file, which should be in the file system now, called ledText.text. And we're going to read each line and put in the text that's in uh, the file, display it on the thing, and wait a second for each between each line. So, uh, so you can see where this is going, right? We have a temperature humidity device. It works on one wire interface, but the new ones have I2C. Um, this actually comes built in with MicroPython. Import DHT. It's that simple. Uh, import machine so you can uh, initialize a pin. So this one is running on pin 4. So you do that. Now it's initialized. And you measure. You do D dot measure. And from there, you, the D gets a temperature and a, has a temperature and a humidity method, which returns uh, the float values. So, boom. It's uh, 22 and a half degrees and 26 percent humidity. Might be a little bit more humid up here than down there. Um, so let's take that. Uh, that data and display it on the LC, uh, the matrix display. So you can see it's 23 degrees. This one is connected to Wi-Fi uh, if you want, so you can display other things as well. Uh, oh, yeah, this thing moves. So I bought a little toy thing, which has uh, two tracks, just an engine, and uh, if you apply uh, a, a current or a voltage, it's six volts, then it goes forward. So let's try to do that. You specify the pins. Just, let's just do the two left first. Um, and then the two, let's turn it on first. Did I turn it on, maybe? Uh. Yeah, this happens sometimes. It's not entirely demo-proof. So the idea is that you can turn this thing on and off. But um, you can also use something else, which is called pulse width modulation. And what that entails is that instead of just having binary on and off, you can go on and off, on and off really fast. And y to the engine, it would almost be like the signal is weaker. So uh, using pulse width modulation, you can actually give it the range. So the motor is not on and off anymore. Now it goes 50% uh, speed, 30% speed. So what you do there is that you fr specify the frequency. Um, I use 50 hertz, like uh, uh, 50 on and off a second. And then the duty, uh, you can s uh, look at it as like a duty goes from 0%, then it's just off, to 50%, uh, then it goes on for 50% of the cycle, and then off. Um, or 100%, then it's all on. So it goes from uh, very low, uh, zero, to full. So this just shows how you can imitate this high, or low signal by, by changing the duty, the, the percentage. So, um, let's try, oh, I wasn't connected entirely. Okay. So if we try that, if it works, if it doesn't go crazy on us, um, we're now instantiating the uh, 
PVM, we import PVM from machine. So it's, uh, it's from machine that we import everything. Um, we instantiate the PVM on a pin for left and for right. And those are the tracks. And uh, the NDC LED is the LED inside of there. I don't think we're going to use it. And then on this um, PWM object that you have, you can do uh, two left duty, and it returns the duty that it's on. It's zero. And then you can go, let's try 300. It goes, since it's 12-bit, um, it goes uh, from zero to, what is it? 12-bit would be 4,000. So this one goes to uh, 1,000, I think, 1,000, which would be the 100%. OK. So then, let's try it. So now, instead of on and off, it's running a little bit slow. So let's increase the duty here. That's 600. I think we can go up to 900. And back to zero. So now we're able to control this um, speed. So turning radius, stuff like that. Um, I mentioned how how uh, interrupt handlers are nice to have, but only if you uh, want to interrupt your executing code in order to read a value, maybe send it off. But um, there's uh, something called UAsync IO, which uses coroutines. So this is a different way of programming where you set up uh, tasks on async functions, and then you say, uh, run these uh, tasks, and the the, the functions themselves, they yield. Um, so it executes in, the, in a function, and then it says, oh, I'm not going to be doing anything for five seconds. Come back to me uh, in five seconds. And then there's a, I think it's round robin approach, where it goes through all the tasks. And um, that enables you to run things concurrently. So if we try to go crazy now, let's do the file to lead, the thing that shows um, the text on here. Let's make a temperature measurement. Um, and what this does is instantiates the temperature thing. And this one sleeps for one second. So this sleep is a blocking sleep, while the uasync io.sleep is not a blocking sleep. That actually yields to the, to the next task. So we're going to see how that actually affects. Um, we have two little buzzers here, so let's try those as, as well. Um, we're going to be playing a song, and then eventually there's a killer uh, function here, which um, it just uh, waits for 20 seconds, and then it exits the function. So it works like this. You set up an event loop with uasyncio. You create the task file to lead. You create the task temp that we looked at. And then we're going to instantiate two buzzers and try to play the same song um, so to see if it actually goes out of sync or if it uh, runs at the same time, which it should. And then at the end, on the event loop, we're going to run until run all the tasks until killer is complete. And killer takes 20 seconds. So since this is a lot of code, the paste mode doesn't always work, but we can try it. Uh, unexpected indent. So it would be nice if we could get this uh, presentation to work again, which we can try. Print one. Yay, it works. Um, I don't know if it remembered all of this or if this is actually. But let's try it. Let's run it.
Hurrah, it worked. Uh -huh. So if you notice the uh, one second uh, blocked the entire everything because it's just standing there in this uh, one task waiting. Um, I guess I'm approaching the end, um, but I would like to try to one last thing, I guess. So if we go to um, one thing we haven't done yet is that we haven't uh, uh, final source. We haven't put a main.py uh, program in there, so then it can run uh, like independently. I don't have to put code in there and for it to run. So um, there is one called breadboard HTTP server. So I'm going to put on my um, hotspot now on my phone. And I'm going to be connecting to this hotspot on the phone. And let's put um, the file onto the device. And what you can do is that you can try to connect yourself to uh, SSID is uh, Kubernetes life line and password is work work. So if you connect to this uh, on your phone, to this uh, Wi-Fi, MicroPython, um, what was it called? Breadboard. And we're going to put it, and we're going to put it as name, as a uh, name uh, main.py. So hopefully this will, uh, we forgot the put here, the put command. So we're transferring a file onto the microcontroller. And what it should be doing now is after we recycle, um, reset it, um, if we connect it again, pycocom here, if we reset it, uh, oh. so when I boot up, the pins are acting a little bit uh, wonky. And the, how it's set up with this is that something uh, goes on if I, if I have the toy connected. What's on and off again? This is off. So I need to power my microcontroller and then turn on the tank. And sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Uh -huh. So what we're going to try to do now is that we're going to try to run an HTTP server on this microcontroller. And we're going to try to drive this thing together. Uh, or maybe a reset will do. So if we look, something is going on here. So we try to reset it and see what it does. It's disconnected. And what is the reason for that? Hotspot is on. And if we look at the file, uh, so in my boot dot Pi, I have I made a connect function, and in my main I'm connecting to the uh, Wi-Fi, and then I am um, setting my uh, the pins that are connected to the end to the motors on each side, and then I have an HTML here that I serve using a socket, and it's accepting requests and there. Are two simp there's a simple form here where you can uh, increase or decrease your um, uh, the duty on the pin, right? So I was hoping that we could see whether or not we would be able to drive a particular place. And we have 30 seconds left. Oh, 
Um, does that mean that it works? No. Uh, maybe. It's connecting. It's connected now. So this is the IP address that it's con connected to. Are we able to connect? I wonder. I would also have to connect to my hotspot. Uh, there was another example where we would be using MQTT, and this is a more reasonable way if you want your uh, devices to uh, connect to the internet and talk to each other, send uh, temperature measurements up and down. Okay. Is anyone able to see? You are? Well. I don't have to be able to. Yeah, I I haven't turned it off on yet, or I haven't connected. But if I connect the battery, so I have a battery here on the side, that means I don't have to use this USB. And if I turn it on, darn it. Or th maybe someone has turned on. Yeah, it could be that it was not supposed to do that. But it's worth one more shot. And maybe uh, some electrical engineer would like to help me out next time. But something is happening now, so go ahead and try to uh, hit this thing, hit this uh, mushroom. <laughs> See if you guys can do it. I think it starts uh, turning at maybe like 500, 600. Where are we at now? Ah. <laughs> Anyone uh, for the turn right? Really into the turn left? Oh, it's not working. Oh, but we can't do anything with that. Well, at least someone here in the audience is moving one of the motors, which is kind of cool. Let's give it one last go. And and Work, work is the password. I'll show you again. <laughs> so, uh, we have the same issue. Only one direction. It might look that way. So, since I don't have a web wrapper now, I'm not ab able to see uh, the print output, which I would be able to see if I had the web wrapper set up. I need to connect it to that device in order to, to, for, to do that. So with that uh, climax, <laughs> I think uh, we're done. I think the tips would be um, always uh, document what you're doing. Uh, don't get too uh, invested if something is not working right. You have to leave it alone, go back. Uh, because uh, a lot of times there's just a miswiring somewhere and you just have to uh, uh, distance yourself from the problem before you come back. Um, try to get started, buy some uh, microcontrollers, they're really cheap. Uh, get a laser cutter, they really help to make your project even look even cooler. And uh, have fun. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>